My name is David East and I'm an artist and educator teaching in Baltimore at the Maryland Institute College of Art and living and maintaining a studio in Brooklyn, New York. I am honored to be involved in Art Access and to take part in the Art Access Conversations as part of the 2018 National Clay Week. Presented with the theme of industry, I considered several different approaches to this short talk, but in the end I found I had to focus on the theme of work, of how things are made and how our perception of how a thing is made affects our experience of it and the way we place value on it. Through the 20th century we see a back and forth, a push and pull around and between poles, the machine and the hand being the most recognized set of poles. Each gathers around it our fascination and our hope, and in this a false dichotomy between the authentic and inauthentic forms. John Dewey argues that a person's experience of things is shaped by the context in which they are viewed. I could watch this all day. The big jig in, jig in the Fiesta Ware factory is an amazing thing. I wonder over the ingenuity and skill of its creation and use in this West Virginia fac factory. Yet this approach, this machine of my fascination, arguably runs counter to many of the ideals that served as the foundation of my own training. We can trace the various debates, movements, and cycles that ascribe the value of work within objects and art. Within Western ceramics field, we understand the studio craft movement and its nascence with the arts and crafts movement of the 19th century. Within ceramic art history, industry conjures up the ideas of the clean, the machined, framed within the arts and crafts movement as unethical, even sinful, the exploitive. John Ruskin's influence is not just aesthetic, but moral and social. The first art historian to serve in academia, Ruskin believed life should be beautiful, inequality was an outrage, and that capitalism leads to aesthetic degradation. I can't disagree. Yet, we must remember that Ruskin also believed in maintaining hegemonies and patriarchal power. He held to older conservative traditions that believed in hierarchy and the established authority. William Morris took Rus Ruskin's ideas to actual practice, and, through many of, and though many of his designs live on, his Marxist ideals were never realized. The arts and crafts movement, begun as a response to industrialization and urbanization that developed in the early 19th century, these changes created enormous upheavals socially and politically. The social institutions that had worked in rural life were not scaled for the realities of urban life. No education, no health care, no pensions. Deskilling leads to alienation, regional differences replaced with consistency. Add in the stimulation of Marxism, and we get a movement typified by romance, medievalism, simultaneously backward-looking and progressive, a linking of social conditions and design. These ideas have a central effect on Western ceramics in the 20th century, and set in motion many ideas that become the field's cliches, standardization as the enemy of creativity, for instance, or that the mechanical is without authenticity or soul. It is Philip Johnson's organization of a 1934 exhibition at MoMA entitled Machine Art that we see some pushback on this trajectory. Johnson, a central figure in modernist architecture, early in his career was part of the architecture department at the Museum of Modern Art. There he curated several important exhibitions, including Machine Art. This exhibition featured utilitarian, machine-made objects such as springs, pots and pans, and scientific instruments displayed on pedestals, elevating them to the level of sculpture. Pursuing the modern, modernist impulse towards authentic form, combining the musculature of the abstract expressionist movement with an Americanized understanding of the Minge philosophy of Suyetsu Yonagi, in the United States we see a new incarnation of manly labor in the figure of Peter Volkus. The figure of Peter Volkus looms large in the canon of our field, but who creates and perpetuates these images, and how are we responsible for understanding them now? Volkus is seen as the active macho genius, but is also described by his care and consideration within each aspect of his work. The work of Marguerite Wildenheim is differently complicated. Her image describes the poetics and beauty of work and labor through an elegant and ethical lens. Hers is the legacy of failed Bauhaus ideals, where art, craft, and industry were to reunite. This remarkable photo of her hands in motion, describing the method through which she would throw a picture, now an expression of the mythic state that she occupies. 
we have seen the field of ceramics opening up through multiple lenses, those of design and digital fabrication, as in the work of Oliver Van Hurt, and the often misunderstood de-skilled expressive, now prevalent in contemporary art, as in the work of Arlene Sheckett. Many of these changes are perceived with suspicion and sometimes contempt, but I would have us embrace the multivalent potential of our medium, its ability to squeeze in between ideas. Using objects, film, and performative installation, Neil Brown's word, words work. The factory confronts this false dichotomy head on, workers from Stoke-on-Trent and the artist himself working in the gallery. As Rochelle's is writing on Neil Brown's words work, the factory is of note here. Brown's work began his career in ceramics as an apprentice modeler at the Wedgwood factory in 1987. And it is this formative experience in industry that remains a constant point of reference in his work. The legacy of globalization in relation to Stoke-on-Trent ceramic manufacturing sector and the impact this has had on people, place, and traditional skills is the focus of this work. Ezra Shales states what is so powerful in this work, saying, quote, Brown's word values both the coarse saggers in which fine ware was fired, as well as the dainty porcelain flowers now out of fashion. They are not diametrically opposed aesthetics, but variants of labor, residual evidence of the story of artisanal skills enmeshed in piecework, unquote. Within my own work, many of these ideas has been explored through both the way a sculpture behaves as well as what it emulates through how it was made versus its subject matter. Through domestic architectural and design references, my work revolves around issues of ornament and design as signifiers of our cultural history. This piece, entitled Through This Field, behaves as a functional backsplash while referencing a landscape painting. Sitting on a shelf within the work, a looped 12-minute animation of wireframe floral bouquets provides us with another layer of making, this one found through search commands within a public space, all traces of the hand erased. Often tracing the circuitous route of modernism and its split-level byproducts, the work moves between promise of decorative go home goods to re-articulations of classical motifs within suburban architectural ornament, the quintessential American picnic pattern, the gingham, becomes a low relief utilizing a digital fabrication and then slip cast in porcelain, which then becomes the backdrop for an anthropomorphic bit of colonial trim. Within my work, I have explored a range of approaches to making in order to understand and try and find images that engage with these ideas. Fine porcelain is red as blue foam, the touched clay becomes cast and duplicated. A minimalist form is found in the aisles of Home Depot. The work positions itself between the known, prosaic forms, bits of colonial trim, and an abstracted unknown, pulled from the most basic and cl classical architectural gestures, an arch, an opening. Pieces behave as models, but also obfuscate that view by introducing ornamentation that is scaled as it is in our experience of the suburban everyday. My hope is that because of this tension, we might reconsider some of what has become transparent in our everyday surroundings. My work engages with the push and pull, charting the trajectory of this false dichotomy. I attempt to stay neutral in the work to consider this legacy between the messy ideals and the utopian roots that spring up in the 19th century and their curiously flawed byproducts in contemporary life and design. Thank you.